Welcome aboard all. Special guest this week is Pierre Lawson from Summit Custom Cuts. We chat about his lovely layout and also his little business, which is the first to make modern American style kits. Make sure you watch to the end because he offers us uh, an exclusive percentage off all kits for a number of months, so make sure you watch to the end. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Daz from Model Rory Techniques. Our YouTube channel produces video podcasts and a few little uh, how-to videos in there for a good mix. If you know a model that might fit the bill or another business that might uh, like to showcase their products on our channel, please email me, uh, link below. Don't forget to subscribe to keep the content rolling. I also have a Patreon page, so uh, please anything, any little bit counts to keep the, the content rolling. So without further ado, let's get started. A little public service announcement here. Make sure you vote one for Gordy Robinson in the upcoming NMRA elections. I believe personally he has brought this hobby into the 21st century with such initiatives as the NMRA X virtual clinics and the like. So make sure you vote for Gordy. Welcome aboard, Pierre Larison from the United States. Thank you for taking time away from your family and your lovely layout for chatting with me at Moderare Techniques today. Anytime. So obviously you can be found on, and I'll put all these links below. So it's uh, summit summitcustomcuts.com, and there's obviously he's got his lovely layout on there, and also we'll talk about shortly some of his uh, beautiful offerings, uh, to, um, his, his structures and the like, I should say. And also his email is pbl at summit usa.net so as i said i'll put all these links below so is there any, anywhere else a pair that people can find you you're on facebook or anything like that or is it just best to email you to get in contact with you it's best to email or you can well you, australia that's uh, kind of out of my time zone so but yeah. <laughs> I, I, I answer the phone from nine to five central time too yep. so okay but emailing is the easiest way okay oh most of my People that watch this show anyway or from your part of the world, so I can put um, phone numbers on there, but it's all everything's listed on your your website, which we'll have a look shortly. So, all right, Pierre, I always like to chat with people about how they've got into our lovely hobby and sort of their, their influences and like. So can you tell us a little bit about your history and how you got into to model railroading? Well, I always loved rain too much from us a little boy, and, and, and I wanted... I so badly wanted electric trains when I was a kid, and my mother always thought it was uh, always just a short-lived little pad. So you get tired of that, and they'll end up in the closet, and it's way too expensive. So I got Lego trains, you know, when I was little. So I had to do with that. So, but as soon as I, you know, moved out and had a little bit of room and enough money to buy some, I started out doing the the trains and um. The first one I got was uh, was Fleischmann track, the German uh, brand Fleischmann. Yep, very very. Because I want to have I want to have two rail. I never liked the American idea of having the the, sure. the center uh, the, the lead there, even if it's just nails or looks like nails, big nails, but it still looks stupid. So I went for the <laughs> for the DC version, and um and that was my first one. I did it in my first bedroom in my first little row house and it wasn't big. I didn't have an extra room for the train. So I, I had it made a big, it made, it was suspended from the ceiling of the bedroom. It took up the whole ceiling except for a little operating area around the door. And uh, you could lower it down, but it came tumbling down twice. You know, the anchors in the wall came out and something. And that's, that's a shit idea. It doesn't work right. So I started looking for a house with a with a I I started looking for a train basement with a living living accommodations on top. So so I ended up finding a really good house with a with a good basement and I could live in the middle and I could put my company office in the on the on the second floor. So it worked out great and I built a Danish layout back there. I think I started in in ninety two. Yeah, lovely. And uh, so that was Danish trains, Danish theme, because I like to model what I see. You know, I, so I can go out and take a picture of what I need to know details about and go out and get it and I can build it. 
So, but I always loved American trains, or at least, well, I fell in love with American trains after I had started the Danish train project. Yeah, sure. And I already had a bunch of Danish trains, but and and so I met a guy in Denmark who was doing CSX back in the late eighties, and um, I I leaned more and more towards American trains, but you know the thing that you make one trip a year at best rail fanning and you have get have to get all your pictures and if you're missing some well you have to wait another year to go back and take the pictures you needed for your modeling <laughs> gives you a good so excuse thinking, to come back I'm though stick, isn't it so. i'm sticking with the danish <laughs> so so far but then i ran into a, an american in in uh in 2003 and i we ended up getting married and me moving here in 04 so thinking okay i sold them i tore down the, the layout in denmark and you know, sold all the trains and the house and everything. Sure, sure. So the thing was, when I got here to the States, I was going to model American. And, uh, well, since I'm in Louisiana and and Texas is a couple of hours away, yeah, something, sure. well, I'll, I'll do, you know, South Central Texas. Lovely. Um, I kind of thought I would want to do mountain scenery, but all that. But Texas is pretty flat, so... <laughs> So it's easier to build, <laughs> but but it's uh in in Louisiana that's too it's just a sheet of plywood. Then you have the the Louisiana landscape. Yeah, I mean it's as flat as that. So that's a little bit boring. So I'm thinking, well, let me go with Texas. It's not too far away. I can get there in two or three hours to photo the details if I need any. And um and and we have the same trains running through town here anyway. I'm I'm three blocks away from the Union Pacific Main Line from between uh well it, it's you know from houston to new orleans used to be southern pacific and sure. when the merger happened up took that over up to iowa which is a small town of 15 miles east of here and bnsf got, got the line the X, sp line from there to new orleans because of the competition rules and all that yeah, yeah. so but up has a track drives on it so they run some stack trains all the way through but it's mostly BNSF using that line, and then Union Pacific runs it up and over to Baton Rouge and another line, an ex um, Mopac line, but Missouri yeah, Pacific. So, uh, so UP uses this line as the eastbound, and there's another line 25 miles north of here they go westbound on. It used to be the other way around, but a couple of years ago they they switched that around. Sure, but sure. Um, so. So I, I I walk every day, you know, along the railroad track for my exercise, walk one hour around lunch, lunchtime, hoping to catch a train or two or three. <laughs> so, and I hear the horns blowing every night. It's, <laughs> it's very great atmosphere here. Yeah, yeah lovely. So, so, so I stopped, I thought, well, it has to be a UP layout because I have UP right here and I love, I like UP and I like being a staff. So it's a UP layout would be in a safe track it rides. Sure, sure. And that allows me to make, to run, you know, m- most of the major uh, railroads equipped because I see a lot of CSX power coming through, even more NS power, either on the UP or on the BNSF. And we have some case, Kansas City Southern trains mixed in it too. So, so it, it let allows me to run a big variety of trains but technically it's a up layout with being a safe track yeah lovely lovely so we, the, sorry go on. yeah well and the main line is is the was is original up and see right here we just with the video you're showing right now we just passed over um in a the, uh crossing sure. with Another UP line, but that's an XSP line. It, and you can tell because it has the old uh, G, G target uh, signals that you, uh, that uh, SP used to use all over the place. Sure, sure. So, and the branch line, you, you might show a shut off. Like, yeah, you just showed uh, the MKT depot there in, in LaGrange, Texas. That is an X uh, MKT line. Yeah, lovely, lovely. So off camera just before we spoke about a good friend of yours, Pele Solberg, which is probably one of the uh, 
European legends of the the American scene. I think I think his scenery and the way he composes scenes is second to none. And I can see some major influences in your layout, how you've done your beautiful layout as well. So can you sort of tell us about um, your friendship with Pele? Well, yeah, uh, we met um, because of uh, he had some pictures in the trackside uh, photos section in Model Railroader back in '92. And uh, and I saw it, and another friend of mine saw it, and and uh, the next month he had another picture, and that said, it said Pele Soborg Denmark, and the next one said Pele Soborg Fagum Denmark, which was the name of the city he was in, which was sure. only 20 miles away from us. So, so uh, my friend Yan there, he called Pele and said, hey, uh, we see your pictures, and you're into modeling, and you don't want to meet up, and he didn't know. He only knew very few other people doing model railroading. So, so he thought, oh, great. So, um, and we came, became friends uh, from that. And we, yeah, we met every, every month for 25 years after that, six to eight people we called the train gang. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's the, the host would cook and everybody else would bring wine yeah. and, and it, we took turns, you know, on that. So it was, it was the best time yeah lovely so but when i moved away in 04 of course i could only attend like the three times a year that i usually went to denmark sure, sure. haven't been in over a year now because of covid yeah so but i'm hoping i'll get a vaccination soon to go back to see my old mother she's 93 so she's not gonna last forever yeah and yeah, i'm sure. an only child so i'm the only one he ha- she has so yeah Hope to go back soon, but and and I can meet up with the guys every time I go back. Yeah, lovely, lovely. And uh, you know, we have to go out and have some dinner and and talk trains or <laughs> or talk something else. Yeah. Sometimes some train game meetings never we never didn't get around to talk trains, but yeah. we would have a video <laughs> showing in the background. You know? Yeah. So it sounds a little bit yeah, my but, my sister in law's book club. They meant to talk about the book they're reading, but I, often they just talk about family and drink lots of wine. By the sounds of it, so <laughs> yeah, see that's yeah. Some, drink some wine and have some good food. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Doesn't matter where in the world you are, we do exactly the same here in Australia too. So that's fantastic. So okay, so back to, the, back to what you why you ask me why you asked me about it. That, sure, because he was the influence of how he designed everything. Because yeah. I, I learned from him how to actually make a, a model railroad that would look like kind of realistic, yeah. you know, that would look like, like the real thing that you don't overdo it, not too much, many tracks and everything. So this is, you can, you show, you can see from the track plan that this is a very simple track plan. It's just a single track railroad with a, with a yard and a passing siding and one more passing siding and a branch line. Yeah. So sure. there's ample room to make, to make do the scenery that kind of sets the scene at to where you want to be. And my main town there, Waycross, uh, is um, is actually not existing. It's not in Texas, at least. It's named after Waycross, Georgia, because I, sure. I love the sound of the name. Yeah, lovely. Which is a very it's a big railroad town too. But but um, there's a town in small town called Pittsburgh in Texas, and and, and another one called Hearn that has those uh, that active that has a diamond and a connector. Yeah, sure. And sure. Hearn is all UP country and in the Pittsburgh is UP and in and, uh, and KCS uh, crossing. Yeah, but sure. I kind of made a combination of that because Hearn is a kind of little little town, not too interesting, but it has a yard and a lot of traffic through and, and Pittsburgh's a little bit bigger town. So yeah, lovely. I think, lovely. oh, I might make a combination of that and call it Waycross. Yeah, that's nice. So that's it's nice. a made-up town, and that's the biggest town on the layout. Sure, sure. So but tell us uh, a few stats about the layout, because I know I like to hear how many people have got turnouts, uh, what sort of DCC system you got running. So how about we start with it's 1,200 square foot of room, is my understanding, um, according to your website, yep. correct? Yep, it's so, 11 square foot. Yep. Yeah. So how long is the main line in feet? Have you sort of it's, gone that uh, far? Two, to... It's 280 feet of visible main, main line. line. Right, okay. And dozens and dozens of staging tracks, which obviously don't get included in that. So it's quite quite yes, a large, large lane. There's, 
27 staging tracks. So I started the first layout had uh, the, the staging one had uh, 14 tracks and, and, and two through tracks to get to the, uh, the, the reverse loop. Sure. And, and then it has um, kind of a, a crossing staging. It's only two tracks on the main. That's called staging two, which is behind the backdrop, and and yeah. so because it's a you can run it you can run it as a loop, but I didn't I wanted to have a place to stop the train, so it's not the same train that comes over the 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 um, sure. the crossing. Um, yeah. Soon, but, so you could park one yeah. and run some others, and yeah, so yeah. it's not this, you know, and then there's staging three. Which is also only two two uh, siding two two tracks and a main through sure. that handles the locals that go down the branch line yeah. from yeah. you know on the on the sure. sub that goes down through Lagrange and then I ran out of space of course so I, I did another <laughs> nine track staging or that staging four which in which is under the middle peninsula yeah sure sure so there's a total of so what is that uh, sixteen and 14 and 3 and 3 and 9. So wow. I think it's about it's about 27, 27 tracks. tracks. What sort of yeah. length are some of your your staging tracks? Well, there um the two the staging two is uh, about 22 feet uh staging three. Yeah. That handles uh, the the basically the lo- the locals. Yeah. And the others the so staging two is about 20 Five twenty-six feet, both of them. As are the 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 state the the, the passing siding in Coleman. So the the all trains all all trains of, of twenty-five feet can meet any anywhere. Yeah, lovely. And then I have a few longer trains, some stack trains, and some unit. Um, yeah. Uh, grain trains and, and all trains so that's a little longer and they can meet in way cross. Yeah, sure. So this is all DCC so run as well? Longest, yeah, the longest staging track is uh, what? 30 some feet wow. uh, in, in staging one. Yeah, uh, yeah, they're 25 feet and more those uh, 14 tracks in staging one. Wow. wow. So, so uh, and some of them are too long, but but uh, you know, rather have enough. Yeah, you can never you have know? enough staging. That's that's for sure. No, so. you can't. So, so at least the long trains. Uh, the longest train is uh, about is a stack train with uh, it's the UP stack train with forty cars in 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 four in, three engines. So one two on the point and one pushing. Yeah, sure. So did I? I, I oh, was that, watching. Sorry, go. On. Yeah. I was um listening yeah. to your. Your video last night on a, a layout tour on your your YouTube channel, which I'll also link below. Um, there's one particular part of your layout that is one continuous straight stretch of line that you can have one of your largest trains, so you can see front to back, no curves, unobstructed. So, yeah, you... I called it the Long Lonesome Texas Highway. Yeah, lovely. <laughs> can you tell us a little bit a little bit how why why you did that for starters um, and how you sort of achieved that and. Well, I just wanted a long stretch of track. You could see a, a, a straight train. Sure. Because most models, you know, most layouts have curves, curves all over the place. So you can never see a train, a train straight anywhere. Yeah. And I, I want to just have to have that feeling of, you know, when you, you drive along the track in Texas and, and anywhere in the West, actually, uh, most uh, railroads have a road, some kind of U.S. highway or, or county highway or something next to it, because well, the railroad already found the nice, the easiest route through the landscape, so they just put the road next to it, which which was easier, you know. And so you can follow the trains along there, and out in the sure. west and many places in Texas, it's just a straight track to go on the highway next to it. So you see trains coming by, and they're all straight, and it looks good. Yeah, yeah, lovely. So I think oh, I want to have that on the layout, so you can see uh, a train that's not that's not curving. So yeah, most trains can they those be straight on that piece of track. It's uh, like twenty five, twenty seven feet long. 
Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, and some of the longest train they would have the Indians curve at the end, but but uh, <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> what sort of? It's obviously a DCC so, run. Basically, so you understand, it's basically it's a train watcher's layout. Right. I'm not really much on switching or anything, and that's why that's the reason for it, it has a simple track plan. But I like scenes. You know, a bunch of different scenes to watch the train go. Yeah, sure. So, so that's the the emphasis has been on the train watching and just have a good setting to watch a train go through. Yeah, lovely. So that was my next question. Obviously, you don't you're not into the formal operations type setting. You just like you're more of a rail fan type person by what you're saying. Most yeah, mate. Yeah, it's a train watcher's layout, so it's yeah, you lovely. can go rail fanning on your model layout. Lovely. And, well, I have I, I, I have some, uh, you know, there's a small yard and, and uh, the Coleman Strands holding facility and a couple of other industries yeah. that I can go switch. Just, you know, if I get bored of watching trains, I can switch out those places. And that's fun, too. And some other people that come and run on it, they, they like the switching part of it. Yeah, sure. So, so there, it, there's a little bit of switching, so enough to come keep you out, occupied. But the main thing is running trains and make meets and and just watch run long trains run through town and through the countryside and yeah lovely lovely yeah. so what sort of dcc system are you running well i bought the lens system back in 92 when it or 93 when it first came out in may of 93 i got it in and i've been using that since it's been updated to the latest uh, software version so t- three six which is like more than 10 years ago, but yeah, sure. it's still the, the latest um, update they have. And it's, it's, um, it's good German industrial quality. Yeah. It yeah. just works. And yeah. it's been working flawlessly since 93, yeah, which lovely. is pretty impressive. That's 90, uh, close to be 90, what, 98 to uh, 28 years now. So. Yeah, lovely, lovely. So, and, and it still works. And well, but unfortunately, they didn't go on the sound wagon. So, so all my decoders are soundtracks. I yeah. like soundtracks. They're easy to program and they work very good. Sure. And, uh, but nothing runs as good as a lens decoder. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, love I it, mean, love you it. cannot beat that. And I think Loke Sound probably have them cornered on that. They run very, very smoothly too. Yeah. That's pretty but well. I've got all them. Pardon? All my, uh, Dakota is all bar, probably a handful are all lock sound. I have a few lens as well. Um, yeah. Just venturing into version five ESU lock sounds or lock pilots. So apparently they're very, very good as well. So and they have a very, very good motor control. Yeah. But, but the programming aspect is, I find it kind of, you know, cumbersome and backwards. But of course, I'm used, now I'm used to soundtracks and, yeah, yeah, and, sure. and I find them very easy. Yeah, sure, sure. But, and, well, I and I do. I use the Decoder Pro to do everything because yeah. that makes everything easier. Easier to do, yeah, sure. But yeah, but so so the system is is a lens basic system, and I have um, five of their hand uh, throttles, but they're all tethered because they never no, went no, on no, the right. the, yeah. the radio control. Actually, they have announced, and it's it's been announced now for almost two years. The LR that the LH-101R, a radio throttle, right. that looks very nice on the pictures, but it's not out yet. Yeah, sure. They're pretty slow on getting out with things uh, sometimes, but but I'm it's and it's kind of I think it's kind of Wi-Fi based, like um like the new uh, the latest look sound uh the the ASU sure. uh, throttle that came out with they're kind of a local Wi-Fi. It's yeah. it's the Wi-Fi network principle. But it's a local network just for the ESU system. Yeah, sure. yeah, but, it's very but, similar to my Roco one. But you don't, yeah, and and you don't have to have all these permissions in for different uh, frequencies because uh, Lens tried to come out with one. I see. I was the Lens dealer actually in Denmark from from ninety three <laughs> to oh yeah. four. So I sold a lot of systems. Sure. And they were working on a on a, a wireless system, but it turned out. They had to have 27 different versions just for the European, because the EU, even though it's the EU, all countries still have their own 
frequencies available. Right. So they okay. would have one for the U.S., and they would have like 27 for European countries. Sure. So that just, it killed that idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what, what's, what's a shame? Because lens controllers just keep working. Yeah, they do. So, but, but, but of course, I need the wireless. So I have, uh, it's a local American company. They're out of Texas. It's called uh, CVP Systems. Sure. And uh, and they make some wireless throttles and and um and they're the only ones that make something that'll work with the with the lens system. And you have oh. to have a, a, a special version of their receiver. Oh, I see. But then you can you can use their uh, radio uh, throttles. So I have four of those, the CVPs. Sure, sure. Uh, but but it's uh, I mean it's okay, but it's not the German industri- industrial quality. Right. So okay. there are some issues. So the 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 the, the controller wheel kind of skips. Sometimes it jumps three speed steps uh, forward, or it jumps one back oh, when see. you turn forward. So I can't. They they're not stably working like the lens system does. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, well, I personally yeah. run a. I'm still wait. I'm, as soon as the lens are coming out with the radio control, I'm changing. It? Yeah, sure. I personally use um the the black box Z twenty one by Roco, and that's a Wi Fi as well. So I works for what I I, I like because surprisingly, oh, so, um, so Roco have come out with a with a Wi Fi based uh, radio throttle already. Correct. Yeah. Oh, yep. I didn't see, but in the beginning, the Roco uh, parts were lens product, just Correct. in a different color uh, box. That's right. So, or, um, so I, I've got the the larger one, which has got uh, the loco loco net connections. The, the uh, what what else has it got? Um, the Express bus, which is in here yeah. to to Roco. But also, what was going to yeah, be my Lens next and question? Roco and 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 I think um, uh, there's one of the American manufacturers that use that Express net too. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I forgot their name right now, yeah. but. So I, I I don't really use that. I do I do have a tethered remote in my yard uh, that just runs that because it's exactly the same cabling as a loco net cable effectively. So you got to be a little bit careful because it's plugged in different different uh, different protocol. But um, do you run any software to run this layout like a JMRI or a, I I run Trim uh, Controller? But I do. I have the the JMRI um, the cats system oh, that runs cats. under GMRI yeah that that runs the signal system I was sure. uh, I was so lucky uh, that um, because of my website some guy from Ohio uh, wrote me one one day an email asking how the model railroad scene was in, in Lake Charles because he'd got a job with a university here as a as a math uh, professor and sure. computer science professor. So he moved here and he said, "Well, when you when you get settled in, come over for dinner. We'd talk some trains." And and he came over, and it turned out he was he's uh, very in, much involved in GMRI as their lens specialist. I mean, sure. how lucky is that? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so and I never got really caught by programming. All I'm an electronic engineer by myself, but all that yeah. programming I never really cared to do. Yeah, so. Sure. And I, we, and so I wanted to do the signal system. He said, "Oh, I can write that program, no problem. I do that for you." So, yeah, nice. so he did all his programming of of the cats system. So it's all run on JMRI and uh, with the Bruce Chop um, um, nodes and everything. His yep. boards with input output boards. Sure. So I bought those, and and it's it's running fine. Yeah, lovely, lovely. So that does uh, takes care of all the signal. Sure. So, so, so it's the Bruce Chop system that runs the all the, the lights, the signal lights, and the, the the turnout indication of you know which way the the switch the thrown, and and all the the, um, the occup, occupy detectors the the for the track, you know, you know the occupancy, occupancy detection. detection. Yeah. That's that's uh, with um, I forgot the name of the actually models, but but um, I used to have the lens 
but they were not really um, stable enough because when you have um, when you have uh, um, I have some um, what they call the frog viewer users, you know the Tam um, Valley, Tam Valley Depot, Depot frog yeah. Users. yeah. I have frog users on every turnout, and they're just they're the greatest invention since the wheel. <laughs> I mean, it just worked. I never have anything stalling in turnouts sure. ever. So and and I and I changed the they have the, the dual frog user. I use for the the reversers for the reverse uh, loops, yep. balloon track, yeah, reverse loops. I used to have the lenses and they were fine, but not compared to the, they they could short out sometimes or make trouble, but I switched to the Tambella Depot, the double, the dual tr- frog too, so you can, you know, you can remove a jumper and then it's a double, it's a reverse instead of a double right. uh, frog too. And it just works. Perfect. Yeah, sure, sure. So smooth. Yeah. So uh, Duncan McRae definitely makes some quality products. Uh, I I personally use his dumb uh, five amp boosters on my layout, um, and I, I just love them. Just put them in line. There's, there's no no bells and whistles to them, but they just they just work, and it just seems to be like most yeah, of his, I, most of his I, gear. I take a look at that one day because well, I had the I had the the, the lens of amplifier, the booster of the, the LV hundred. But and then I needed something bigger, and I went with the CVP has some uh, what are they called? Um, some something. But it's all it's all in the presentation video. But it's yeah. a, I have two same it's a two seven amp uh, booster from CVP sure. that runs the track. You know, so one covers all the staging yards and the ramps up to the layout and part of the layout and the other one uh, carries the rest of the layout. Yeah, sure, sure. So, you know, to even out the load because you need more power to the ones coming up the ramps from the staging than the right. ones running on the layout. So that's why I kind of split the, the power out like that because I had one to begin with and when we were like, we were three people trying to run each a train we yeah. found out we overloaded the the the, the amplifier, so sure. it was more than the seven amps. But you know, because most of the trains have three or four engines on them, and with sound and all, yeah. So that draws some power. So I needed I needed two boosters. Yeah. Sure. So those are the CVPs, and they've been working excellent. Lovely. And Lovely. and 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 one of their um uh, electronic breakers they call um Sonshare. CVP calls them. It's like electronic parkers. So you can adjust how much power you want. Uh, when, the, when, so if you have a, a short someplace, it doesn't shut down the whole layout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. In, in four zones. Yeah. And then my own lens um, a booster, the three amp boosters, I took that out so that only runs the all the turnouts. So if you get and the reason being, the, if you short with a locomotive, you come out and short a, a, a turnout, you can't correct it because now the system is shorted out. Yeah, sure. So, sure. But if you run your own the booster only for the turnout, you can always throw the turnout back yeah. to being right, and then, then it eliminates the, the short. So so everything still works when you separate the, the turnout um, DCC from the, the from the track yeah. piece. that's probably one of the best pieces of advice i think i've ever been given on that very fact <laughs> so you can because obviously i don't know about your layout but if you're going to have some sort of short it's normally on mine anyway is on a turnout a scissor switch or something like that that's just nice to be in the to... staging where you can't read it can't... <laughs> well that's the other one or a place you can't can't reach it so <laughs> so yeah. Also, I found very interesting now when I was watching your video on your layout last night was the control panels that you use, the infrared sensors um, coming into your staging, which turns track power off effectively. And then you got route control buttons to get trains back out. Yeah. Can you sort of explain that a little bit? I think that was that was fascinating. Yeah, I started out with the, the, the Heathcote. Um, it's a British company. That made some uh, infrared detectors, and um, and they work fine. 
for a long time. You just have to let it sit for like four or five seconds till the delay timed out to see if sure. if it still would catch the train. And sometimes it would move after that, and then it would stop. So, and then I found uh, a couple of years ago, three or four years ago, I went to the RPM meet uh, up in, in uh, St. Louis, and there's this uh, Iowa scale engineering yeah. had a booth there with their little bitty sensors. And they were cheap, but like right. less than half the price of, of the other ones I had. And very, very small. They're only about, you know, about a couple of inches long and, and half, yeah. less than half an inch wide. Sure. And they detect marvelously. And that's the best infrared detectors ever. Yeah. So I, I switched everything out yeah. to the to those to the Iowa scale engineering. They just work flawlessly. Yeah, sure. So so uh, yeah, so they uh, they sense whenever the train at the end uh, is at the end of the track and just kills the power off. So you won't listen to all that noise yeah. and it won't move any further. <laughs> yeah, so lovely. and then then it, then they're overridden whenever um, it's time to leave the the staging track. I, I built, um, it's a relay system that I built, designed and built that just overrides the the infrared detector. Sure. So you can still turn the power back on and it's on, it's on a timer. So power's on and on, on in for two minutes. So, you know, so you can get the whole train out with helpers and everything and pushers and stuff. Sure. So you clear the track before the power drops back off. Well, and then when the tr- when the track is cleared, you don't cover the sensor anymore. Well, the tracks the power stays on, but the timer sure. drops out. And so the next time the train comes up to the sensor, it'll kill it again. Yeah. So yeah. I had to have a time limit on it. So, but you, you can run into any track until they hit the end, and then it, it it's shut off. Yeah, lovely. That's a that's a very novel way of doing it because. You know, having them cluttering away underneath your well, layer can be you very noisy. To, <laughs> yeah, and you don't have to keep an eye on um, where the train is. Correct. You know, and you can't see it anyway because then you're hidden staging. So it's nice that it stops when it gets to the right point instead of sure. just running too far and running through switches turned the wrong way or whatever. Yeah. So, well, now I have some video surveillance on it anyway, so I can see where they are. But it's not as precise as having a, a, a sensor to to stop the train when it's when it's where it needs to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. I use infrared on my layout purely just to. I use a, a program called Train Controller, which is a German-based software to run my layout, and I use the infrared to get very, very accurate stopping distances over my. KD electromagnets to do the little KD, what they call the KD dance, I call it, so the, uh, to uncouple my trains in my yard. So that, that they work oh, quite yeah, well. Yeah. yeah. So I use a, a brand would. called Azatrax, um, which is uh, uh, John Parsons, out of, you know, I think he's on the eastern seaboard of, of your country there. So, so yeah. No, yeah, I've, I've, I've seen him. I've, I've seen this stuff. So I'm just sort of. My, I haven't seen this whole video that's sort of playing off in the background here, and it's just like I'm mesmerised by it. So I'm, I'm, I'm not 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 trying to be rude, but <laughs> it's just I love seeing trains trundle by. So the scenery that you've got, as as we've already spoken about, the influence of sort of the Pelés and the like, it's exceptional scenery. Um, I just think. Well, thank you. You've you've nailed what what I like about scenery you know, is that you've definitely coined the phrase that you you touched on before about less is more. So less track, not going overboard with weathering, but it just, you've done, it just just fits the scene. You know, I've only been to the United States once, but I, what I can remember of, you know, like through Arizona and, and the like, where it can be a little bit flatter for where we were anyway. It's just lovely scenery. So you really need to be commended on the skill that, that you've got. That's unbelievable. Well, thank you. So, See, and there was another piece of advice from uh, Pelo that I remembered that, you know, when it comes to detailing, you, you have you have to have enough details uh, to make it look real. Sure. But not too many. 
because then, then all of a sudden it looks cluttered. Yeah. So easy on the details, just enough so it looks right, and then nothing more. Yeah, sure, sure. So, so when you compose a scene, say for this layout, you, you talked about going trackside, so to speak, and taking taking a lot of photos. Let's let's talk about Lagrange for a sec. Um, because it's a lovely little town. I think in your video you said it was in real life. It's nine blocks long. Um, yeah, it's nine so blocks of streets running. Yep, and you've yeah. modelled four of it, I think. So, so you've actually. Yeah, yeah. Do you, I only had room for four. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, that's right. It gets rather long <laughs> otherwise, isn't it? So, do you actually then try to model that as closely to the prototype as you can, or you take a little bit of poetic license? So, I'm more talking about the compression of of the layout here without sort of going overboard and taking away from its theme of of the of the town. Yeah, of, of course you have to compress a lot, but but uh, I'm careful not to overdo it because you still have to look right, and, sure. and usually. If you compress too much, that's that what gives that's what give it away when it's a model, and you, you, it looks good. You can still see it looks good, but there's something wrong, so you can tell it's a model. Yeah, sure. And that's usually because uh, you compress some things too too much. Yeah. You know that the car is a little too too long for the building is sitting in front. Yeah. And you know things like that. So I'm trying to compress as little as a and, you know, I have to compress, and I call it that little depot you see there on the on the screen. Yeah, sure. The Lagrange depot. It's actually a little shorter than the real life one is, but nobody would ever notice because it's it's a little boring piece of wall that I shortened. But everything else is to scale, so it looks right. But you have to shorten something at, sure. at places. But sure. the Lagrange, the only thing correct about Lagrange is the street. The layout of the street and and the Lagrange Depot. Sure, that's exactly how it looks. But some of the buildings along the well on the on the aisle side of the track is pretty accurate too, because it's just the, the yards of the the houses butting up to the to the street where the track is in. But on the other side, it's kind of other businesses that are there. I try to make it you know look right. And I think I achieved it, but but um, it's not exact to what's there at all because yeah, it's sure. um, the buildings are either too big or too boring or you know <laughs> so sure. So, but there's a fire station next to the track, so that's yep. correct. That one. Yeah, lovely, lovely. So, and that, nobody would notice the difference unless they live in the in in the Lagrange. Sure, sure. Now. Obviously, your layout is at practical completion. Obviously, us model railroaders, we never, ever finish our layouts in some shape or form. You can form, always throw in some details here and there. That's right. So what's and what's on the drawing the board for the layout right now? Well, uh, really not much um, because I can't really fit anything in, more in it that would look right. Sure. I changed some buildings now and then, you know, um, because in the office park up there by uh, Wake Forest Junction is fairly new, and there were some mobile homes sitting on a big piece of land before, like a, a manufactured home. So I changed that out with a with an office park and a bigger parking lot and stuff. But other than that, I haven't really redone anything. Yeah, sure. And uh, yeah, it's uh, I don't know where to cut into stuff because I'm afraid I'll ruin the. The feel of the it. The feel of it, because yeah, sure. It, it's it's pretty much, I mean, I, you always, when you start doing your planning, you have a picture in your head what you want to do, you know, for you, 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 on the inside of your eyes, eyelids, you can see what you want to achieve. And it, I must say, it came out pretty much the way I pictured it. Yeah, lovely. So I don't really know what to change. <laughs> and there's really nothing about it I don't like. Yeah. Maybe um, I upgraded some scenery, some uh, some of the earliest uh, grass and fields and stuff yeah, I did. Sure. I changed some of that to because new materials came out in the main in, in between. You know, I started this in in uh, in the beginning of oh ten of of twenty ten. So and them in them ten years, uh, some new materials came out that were nicer and more real looking. So I sure. changed some 
scenery products out yeah, sure. to make it look better. Out of interest, but what scenery products that's do you pretty use? Much, yeah. Will you pardon? Well, sorry, out of interest, what scenery products are you using? Well, mainly uh, a woodland scenics, of course. You can't do sure. much without that. But see all the that low uh, grass, turfy grass there. Yeah. Um, you see um, some places. Uh, that's that's uh, silthor. Sure. Grass mats. Yeah. Um, it's a. I think it's a German product. Correct. Yeah. And it's damn expensive. I mean, <laughs> thirty thirty dollars buy you a foot by a foot and a half. Yeah. I mean, it's just it's like it nothing. Was... Yeah, like around the. If you see around the gas, uh, the, the oil uh, derricks, yeah, the little, uh, you know, the oil pumps in the Texas field there, that's all uh, that uh, silver mats. Yeah. And, um, yeah, lovely stuff. I use it personally myself but, uh, as well. But they have her stuff too, uh, the same brand. So, um, yeah, they make a lot of good stuff, but a lot of woodland scenics too, yeah, and sure. and and the, and the static grass and. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So let's get into change of pace. So we'll get away from the layout here, so to speak. So another passion of yours is Summit Custom Cuts. So sort of tell us how you got into. And we've got the website up here. If you can, if you can see that pairs. Yeah, um, I see it. How you got into this um, cottage business? I suppose is probably the. Well, yeah, it's uh, because my main business is um, I do some uh, stainless steel products uh, that go, I mean go, that mainly goes to the oil industry. It's some um, explosion proofed enclosure for I did see for this, yeah. yeah. So, so that's my main product, and then I couldn't spend all day doing that, and and I needed some modern buildings because I love a model, modern layout, and there's sure. really not a lot out there. And actually, when I was still in Denmark, uh, Pilot uh, draw some buildings from for his Mojave layout, the Arco gas station, and he's got a Denny's. And he's, he, it's been he's been uh, portrayed in Model Road Order several times, and some of the other modern motels and other restaurants, a KFC and a McDonald's. And I I had this machine, the the CNC machine that I cut the parts on for his model. And um, so that was a way to do it where you can't buy what you need. You have to build what you need. Yeah, sure. You know, I cut some parts and the rest of it kind of built from styrene strips and whatever. I just cut the hard stuff to make. Sure. You know, the bunch of windows all has to be the same size and sharp edges and nice, nice looking and all that. So when I got here, I knew how to do the stuff I needed because he showed the way on that. And, um, and I, I thought, well, I need it. I'd lo- I like the Taco Bell and the motel. So I think I'm going to make that for myself because it fit. You know, the, the modern city I was going to build, it needed some modern uh, businesses and, and motels and fast food. And so, and, um, and then uh, in 05, I think, he had a new article in, um, in Model Railroad, or Pella did, was his, uh, his uh, Mojave layout. And a bunch of people emailed him about, hey, where do you get all the modern buildings? <laughs> and, and he told me about that. I'm thinking, hmm, maybe that's an idea for a little side business because, well, I don't have them either. I need them for myself. So when I make a, a building for, my, for me, I think I'll make it so, so it's mass producible because there's probably some people out there who need them as bad as I do. Sure, so that's sure. actually the thought of it. I'm I needed them for myself. I cut them on that little machine and I made it, you know, so it was easier to cut and easier to recognize each part and all that. If you work that into the design of the building, it's easier for people who didn't design it to put it together. If you know, with some, 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 some tabs, some tabs and slots here and there. And so, you know, you can see which part to go parts go together. Well, so that was the beginning of that. So I came out with the motel. That's the first one that came out in, in the fall of 05. And then I made the Taco Bell in, in the, I think, February 06. And then I, I, I made, I had my website made so I could 
in either sort to sell it. I tried to build a hobby shop in a train store in Houston, um, was the biggest one at the time. And so I had them on display there, but it didn't really sell anything. So I'm thinking, well, the way of, to have a website, you can't sell nothing without a website. <laughs> So I put them up there, and it they started selling slowly. It wasn't much to begin with, but sure. then I added the Denny's, the coffee shop style Denny's uh, restaurant, and uh, and that added some. And I made a small strip mall, and you know everything that I needed for my layout, and it slowly took up. Oh, it took off and and started selling pretty good. Yeah, sure. sure. And it's and it's a pretty good. Uh, Pretty good side business now. It's still a side business, but it's a very good supplement, especially these days when all is down and COVID is growing yeah. and nobody nobody's buying anything. No, so, that's and wrong. And home, so they needed some to do some more building. So it actually went up twenty percent this year because of, <laughs> I guess because People everybody was sick yeah and needed to build some buildings. So and the other and the old business that dropped down twenty percent. So so at least. At least something went up. Yeah, sure, sure. So, <laughs> so, uh, so it's been okay, and it's, uh, I mean, so far it's it's a, it's a very good, um, makes some very good financing for my train craze that I can right. sell all them. Bills. It pretty much paid for the whole layout. Yeah, lovely, lovely. So and you go so. out. So you then go out. So we've got, obviously got the Waffle House up here, which is a little Waffle House restaurant kit. So. You actually yep. go out and measure the buildings up, or how do you scale the building, and or how do you about going the design phase? Of well, it? the only one I actually ever measured up was the the, the the Lagrange Depot, the MKT Depot in Lagrange. That old wooden, it's a wood kit, and um, that's the only one I measured. Everything else, I I take pictures from, from all the sides I can get to. Sometimes you can't get to all sides, but most. Most of businesses you can get around, and they have a public parking lot or so, so you can get in there. Sometimes a manager comes comes storming out and says, "Why are you taking pictures?" And I usually have a catalog printed out. Said, "Hey, this is what I do. This is why." And they they all they calm down. So, oh, okay, that's fine. Yeah. So they're okay. <laughs> so, but Americans are very nervous about people taking pictures. See, as a Dane, I'm, I was very surprised. Why are they so damn paranoid? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just taking pictures. I'm not shooting at you. I'm yeah, just pointing yeah. at you and taking pictures. But everybody's, oh, who's spying on us? Yeah. We're not spying. I'm just trying to make a model. Yeah, sure. So, so but when you explain to them what you're doing, they they calm down and they're fine. And um, so, but I always have a door in in the pictures. That's my reference. A, a door is usually yeah, about sure. seven feet tall. So and I measure everything out with a ruler and a caliper from from the door, sure. and you know calculate everything down to what, how many millimeters it is in in HO scale, and I draw it up on AutoCAD, and and then I can run it on my I have a, the the milling machine a, a CNC milling machine for sure. styrene, um, and in an O four I got a laser a cutter. Um, that, but it's only it's good for wood and acrylic and you know cardboard and stuff. But it yeah, it sure. cannot do uh, styrene. Styrene is too soft a plastic; it melts away. It melts the solids. So yeah, okay. it's cut nice. Yeah. So all the styrene is cut on the on the CNC machine, and the and the wood and the and the acrylic is made on a laser. Yeah, lovely. The laser, it's much. It's a faster way. It's much faster. There's no material waste, yeah. and you're not you're not milling out stuff. So there's not a lot of shavings and stuff you have to clean up when you're using the laser. But as, as a milling machine, it's it's really a little end mill that's cutting off, you know, like a saw, yeah, sure. cutting through material. Sure, sure. So it makes a lot of mess. But so all the windows are so the windows and doors they are all. Sc- sort of scratch built with your milling as well or do you sort of buy yep. titchy type windows or the mass produced no, types I don't no? buy anything the only thing I buy uh, support materials is I uh, buy uh, some uh, metal siding from sure. um, from pike stuff 
if you're familiar with that brand, he makes a lot of metal buildings. Oh. And and some of the buildings, the base is a metal building, and I changed the front of it, so I buy those, um, you know, bulk, in yeah, bulk. Sure. Sure. And and then I buy um, a plastic sheets for oh, okay. sure. the, ran- the random stone on the on the modern Taco Bell, for example. That's those are bought from uh, from plastic. And not bricks anymore because I lace the bricks now. But but uh, okay. if it's any kind of other uh, structured uh, siding, I I, uh, I buy it from a plaster. I, I use several plaster buildings and the tiles, the roof tiles for the Taco Bell, for example, the old clay tile shape. That's a plaster product too. Sure. So that's what I, I buy very few products as you know as support products of the model, but most of it's it's, it's made in house. Lovely on the like the milling machine. So what's your been your favorite project, I suppose, for one of your buildings? What was the the, the, the your favorite one? Obviously the build because everything's for your layout, as you have said. Um what's you know, what's been your, your favorite undertaking regarding the summit models? Hmm. It's hard to pick a favorite, actually, because it's always interesting to do a new building. You know, well, I don't know. <laughs> they all, they all look good. Yeah. I mean, well, the well, the new Taco Bell's was probably that was very interesting to make. It has some very little small details. It's kind of you have to be, use a pair of tweezers to put it together. So it's a it was a little cumbersome, but it came out really good. Yeah, that one. That one that there. That you have. Yeah. Yeah, it's lovely. I love the colors on and, it. And the stone abutments and, at the front look really really nice as well. And the older one, well, that was my first after the hotel. It's the first building I made was the 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 nineties uh, Taco Bell. And um, had a lot of arches and stuff. It took a lot of calculating to figure out how to do that. And when you're new on AutoCAD, it, it's, it's a lot of trial and error. But yeah, I got sure. it figured out over the years. So. Yeah, lovely. <laughs> but uh, then on the brick, brick building, like the old Taco Bells, the 70s and 80s, all them bricks, I mean, all the motor lines, it, they're drawn up first. You know, they're drawn up in AutoCAD. That takes forever. But... uh. But it looks good when it's done. When when it's, and you sometimes you be surprised how long time it takes to make a new kit. No, I, I took the, like the CBS okay. building. I don't know if you had shown a picture of that yet. Uh, the CBS pharmacy. That's one of the biggest building I'm making. And okay. it's it's. I mean, the bigger the building, the late the least the less they sell quantity wise because most people don't have the real estate. To yeah, spend sure. on on a non railroad related building, so but but I actually sold a bunch of them, even though it's such a big footprint for a non railroad building. Yeah, sure. But it took it took it took like three, three or five months or so to make. Wow. Um, you know, drawing it up and figuring out how to how it should go together and yeah. So when there's a lot of people asking about special projects projects like oh can you model this building for me uh no i don't i don't take special orders because you don't even if you never tried to do it you can't imagine how long time it takes to get yeah. to to draw it all up and get all the parts right sure i'm, I'm getting better i could do it a whole lot faster now than i could 10 years ago because yeah i don't know what to look for but sure but it still takes a long time i suppose unless it's going to come down to and you whether you've had buildings like that that you think that you can resell on i suppose because obviously you're never going to make your money back with your time and the effort into one one building alone and no one's going to be pay several thousand dollars for a building are they for all the time you have put into it so let's see yeah, it's quite an interesting concept no and, and I'm, i made a, a little insurance office of building here i don't have it on the layout I'm, i mean I, I don't have it on the website either i was thinking of making an office building out of it later but but I, I haven't still. But but he insisted of having a model of his house, his office. Uh, office. He said, "Well, give me a number. Give me a number." So, well, between two and five thousand. 
Okay, that's fine. Okay, so with that attitude, I'll do it. Yeah. But I usually take special assignments like that because everybody's shocked about the cost and they yeah. uh, they think they think I'm robbing them. But uh, that's the time I have into it, and it ended up costing four thousand. Yeah, with well. you know, with my time and everything, How especially. Big was the Oh, it was about uh, 12 by 7 inches footprint, but it had a tall uh, roof with, with a, that kind of, you know, had a break in it on all, all sides. So it had six different angles of the roof line, and they all came together. And just to figure wow. them angles out was, was terrible. And there was a large roof, and it took forever to put shingles on it. So, yeah, that's... That drove up the price a whole lot, but it all had to be designed from bottom, and yeah. all the windows and the and the shutters on the side of the windows and everything had to look right. It took forever. Wow! But it wow. ended up being—he was very happy with it. Ah, he was—he was happy to pay the price. I mean, it, was, yeah. it came out very good, but it took a long, long time. I had yeah. a year to do it. I said, you know, yeah, I can't work on it every day, but. You give me a year and I'll finish it. So, <laughs> so that was constructed all then he was worked that... on it for a year, but I had I had eighty eighty to a hundred hours in it. Yeah, wow. So, so that was a constructed building that you sent him or just the kit? No, it was finished. Yeah, F it was fully finished. From, yep. from pictures and he had some drawings <laughs> that not too good drawings and the building wasn't really built according to the drawings anyway when you, wow. you know when you check pictures but it's a lot of photographs and some and some drawings and I, I did it from there and and it finished with i mean the whole lot too with palm trees and the driveway and oh, parking okay. lot everything and the sign out on front right and, so it was a complete project but so it was a finished diorama so to speak not just totally just a model in yeah a really uh yeah, really display, you know that so it wouldn't get dusty on anything. So and and people couldn't look with their fingers either. <laughs> yeah, it's lovely. So because people have a tendency to want to touch stuff. See with their see with their fingers. Yeah, yes. Exactly. And that's just yeah, you can't have that. You're gonna ruin it. Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> if too many does it. So yeah, so but I don't do custom modeling, but I do sell assembled buildings, you know. I sell them as kits. But yeah. if people want them, you know, ready, painted, ready to install, just like the seam on the pictures. Sure. I work with a model builder over in Delaware. That's you can on the website you can build it, you can buy the kit, or you could you can build buy it, build up and paint it. Lovely. So I send it to the model builder and it takes about six weeks to finish it and he'll send it direct to the customer. So oh. it, about seven weeks delivery time. But they just pay me, and I settle with him, and uh, sure. and and it just looks like exactly that it does on the picture. Sure, sure. And I I actually I sell more and more of the buildings, and it's not cheap. I mean, each kit is about between ninety and and two hundred and seventy dollars to have built, have depending been. on the complexity of the kit. Sure. So, but people are willing to pay it. I have one customer; he bought almost all I have. Build wow. up and paint. Yeah, that's a that's a big check you have to write out there. But if you don't think you you, you don't think you can do it, or if you don't want to do it, if well, you don't like to have building buildings and painting and all that, sure. because it's kind of messy and you have to have the right equipment. Sure. So so you can pay your way out of it. Yeah. But well, it comes uh, yeah, down to so, how much money you put on your own time building it if you've got other interests within the hobby as well because that too yeah yeah obviously we've got so many different facets of this this hobby that model building is just one small part of the the, the bigger juggernaut of model trains isn't it so i can see where people personally i build my own buildings but um i can see why people with the cash yeah, wouldn't know a lot so. who don't really want to do the building yeah, they sure. want they care about their trains and they want to weather the trains but they don't care to build buildings yeah. So they can buy it, build up, and and ready to install. So, pairs, we've been coming up, uh, having a lovely chat here for nearly an hour now. So, I just wanted to mention oh, one, one last already? thing. You've 
you have kindly uh, allowed um, a 10% off buying things through your website um, if you were to mention Model Railway Techniques in this conversation and this interview today. So yep. um, so that'll be Just 10%. In- I'll, I'll put that in the description and all that. Um, we might put a, some sort of time frame on it or are you happy for it to go for how long, I suppose, is the next thing. Um because obviously this will be once this goes up. So for the next month or so, are you happy for that or? Or two. Two months? Okay. Two or three, yeah. Well, that's that's right. three months. Okay. If put you three mean, months. Just put, put in the in the comment uh, field uh, sure. that you saw this uh, interview on your uh, web channel there. And, yep. Will do. Uh, yeah, I'll honor that. So what will that? That's, a, that's till the end of um, April then. End of April, yeah. So a- Yeah. 25th in your part of the world, 26th in my part of the world. So we're in the into the future, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's been um, – is there anything more you wanted to bring up about the, your, your products? Or So one last thing I will ask, actually, is there any products in the pipeline that uh, you're looking at building or that you've got your eye on? Um, no, actually, um, I just – the last thing I came out with with the Starbucks – um, and the Shamrock uh, gas station in Enscale. Right. And, uh, well, a lot of people ask me about Enscale, and, and, and most of them I have to disappoint because Enscale is just too small for the details I want to make. Sure. You know, for the, for the equipment I have, there's a limit to how little, tiny I can make it. But the buildings that can scale down, Without sure. them losing detail, uh, yeah, I, sure. I I will do over time. But yeah, but uh, most of the like all the logos, for example, on the on the strip malls, I've had several requests for the strip malls in N scale, and you would think they're easy to scale down, and the building is. But all the logos on the wall, you, they're, they'll be too small in N scale, so I can't yeah, sure. really cut the yeah, equipment. Sure, sure. So so that's um, you know. I put out an in scale when I can. I have a lot of requests also from, not a lot, but some in S scale and and more in O scale, but it'll just be too big for my equipment. Yeah, sure. My sure. production equipment because I have uh, the lasers like twelve by twenty four uh, inches and the and the um the milling machine, the CNC uh, router there. That's twelve and by less than 20 inches yeah nice, nice. so and so and those bigger scales it'll just be yeah it wouldn't be feasible to produce it it would be too time consuming and sure yeah so so i mainly stick to ho and whatever i can downscale i'll do it yeah yeah sure sure all right pairs um thank you so much for taking the time away from the the family and the layout and the laser by the sound of it cutting up these lovely kits that you got going um, I'll put the description below about the ten percent offer. So thank you very much for reach, uh, you know, obviously offering that to, to the to the viewers here tonight. So thank you so much again for having a chat with us. Anytime, it's been a pleasure. That'd be great. Thank you very much. Make sure you subscribe. Click that little bell icon to be notified of upcoming videos. Support us on Patreon. Like us on Facebook and Instagram at Model Railroad Technique.